Hello and welcome to the fourth in our series, Embers into Sparks, for which I'm joined by a very well-known festival Hello face. And welcome to the fourth Oops. in our series, <laughs> I'm, for which I'm joined by a very well-known festival face. My goodness, I'm joined by myself. <laughs> I'm, for which I'm joined by a... Any <laughs> Hello and welcome to the fourth in our series, Embers into Sparks, for which I'm joined by a well-known festival face, Eric Walker, who will be leading the way in the questions in the later part of this session. And today's the birthday of one of the greatest scientists of all time, James Clark Maxwell, who took physics on a giant step away from a world of solid bits and pieces to instead much deeper and more than substantial things, in particular the field, which is a region of form but no substance. Biology, the science of life, is much rooted in atoms and molecules, but some people have argued over the years that there is more to a living system than just its component parts. Among them was the man we're going to hear about this evening, Edward Stuart Russell. His career was in fisheries, and so too was that of our speaker, Dr. Robin Bruce. So, Robin, welcome. And can you tell us first about your own background? Well, good evening and thank you very much for the invitation. And um, thank you for those that are turning up to listen as well. Um, I'm like Russell, I'm from the west of Scotland. Like Russell, I, I'm a born biologist. Like Russell, I went to Glasgow University. Uh, like Russell, I uh, ended up in fisheries um, for many decades um, at the uh, commercial end of it. He was at the research end of it. And we both share a, a view for a wider, a wider appreciation of biology, I think. And really that was, that was how I began to just realize what a fundamental thinker he was. Well, indeed, can you tell us a, a, a bit a bit more, well, first of all, about his life. Right. Well, this is, we're going to try and blow in embers and try and get into the life and work of Edward Stuart Russell. Russell was born in Port Glasgow, 1887. He was schooled at Greenock Academy. He was a graduate of Glasgow University, MA in Classics, 1907, BSc, 1909, DSc, 1921. Employment, government fisheries biologist for some 36 years. He was the author of numerous papers and half a dozen books across biological horizons in the widest sense. He died in Sussex, Sussex in 1954. So the day job is in fisheries biology, but in mm -hmm. fact, it's the amount of research and work he, he did in his own time that really made it an impact? Yes, that's very much the case. Um, Russell was extraordinarily interested in a very wide range of, uh, of, of, of biology. And, um, and he also bridged, I suppose, the Edwardian age, or even the, even the late Victorian through the Edwardian into the post-World War II age. And, uh, 
and had an appreciate an appreciation of the great change in things, I think I would say there. Um, so at the outset, I have to say, I don't really have a thesis here and I've only got the haziest idea for a pre-thesis, okay? The pre-thesis goes something like this. For several hundred years, perhaps several thousand years, we, the Western humans, have been pursuing understanding and explanation of our natural reality by the means of atomism, physicalism, and materialism, and also by invoking the supernatural to enable psychological hierarchical control. Homo faber, not homo sapiens, was Russell's view of humans. We are the makers of things, not the wise ones. That eye-hand-brain triangulation was a predisposition for materialism in Russell's view. This is picked up independently by Ian McGilchrist in his recent works, especially The Matter with Things, where McGilchrist takes his discourse to humans and their cerebral hemispheres competing and co cooperating or not, and the excitations and inhibitions of the functioning brain, and all we have learned about brain structure, function, psychology, and pathology in the last several decades. These are formidable presentations by Michael Christ, which I have not even begun to approach, but interests in problems of materialism are clearly at base shared by both Russell and McGilchrist. Russell's life aim, or life, life aim was to create a method for the study of living things that acknowledged the directiveness inherent in all living things. In essence, living things all do things. They are what they are and they try to grasp the future. They behave, in the broad meaning of the term, living things learn to grow by growing. They learn to see by seeing. They learn to hear by hearing. Likewise, for smell, taste, touch, bodily positional sense, they, in fact, we, it should be we, we learn to walk by walking. We learn to talk by talking. We learn to think by thinking. In short, all living things have an ontogeny. The word is Ernst Heckel's. At a lifespan, all of our own. Living things, in Russell's view, try to make sense of their own surroundings and their own place in these surroundings, and thus create a personal history of their becomingness within their environment. That is my understanding of Russell's efforts in trying to further biological thought. Now, j just to, to, to summarize so far, let's check if I have this right. I, mm -hmm. I, I, hand and brain are important. And even from mm -hmm. when I'm in my cot, I'm reaching out, I'm touching things, picking up things. So I have this idea of a, a solid world. And it's possible then, or it's happened indeed in Western thought, to develop a philosophy about a, a solid world with bits and pieces. But what you're saying is Russell was thinking that living creatures are more something that move forward in time that phrase was grasp the future yeah so grasping the future and russell's more of a process mm -hmm. yeah more of a process yeah i think that's i think that's fair comment yeah and then he's moving away from this idea of fragmentization compartmentalization bits and pieces and then he takes this forward into thought he's looking for a, a type of thought that's not limited by this building blocks picture that I had of me in my cot. I think that's, yes, I think that's right. It's, it's an experiential, it's an experiential existence that, that the living thing is growing through and it's growing with, with, its, with its continual um, appreciation of where it is and what it's doing. So uh, I think that's what Russell was trying to say. The, mo uh, the most obvious uh, statements of the materialistic mode of thought, which Russell was trying to get beyond, are found in two ideas which usually get placed at René Descartes' door. The body-mind division of the living human. Body is body, mind is mind, never the twain shall wait. And the metaphor of the living thing as a machine. 
a clockwork orange tree, if you like, or a clockwork orangutan, or if you prefer a steam engine or a cybernetic system or a robot. Both statements are, I believe, biologically absurd, but we have run with them for hundreds of years. We have conflated analogy and homology. Perhaps even more worryingly, we have conflated concrete with the abstract. So there's been very much this idea of um, a hardcore, a physical kind of outside, like the, the body of a robot and uh, the brain sort of sitting, steering it inside. We're a little bit like the Daleks with the, the brain inside and the, and the robotic body outside. And other people have argued against this because um, one of the names I think you've spoken about before is Alfred North Whitehead, the philosopher who started in a very practical way in, in mathematics and logic, but gradually developed the idea that life was something that permeated everything in the universe. Yes, I think Whitehead's a major, major figure for this period as well. And he has a huge influence, a very, very wide range of people are, have been um, touched by the inspiration of Whitehead. He's certainly not difficult, he's certainly not easy to read in any sense, but um, uh, Russell was, was very impressed with Whitehead and Whitehead's, Whitehead's uh, trying to create a, a, a sort of philosophy of organism as, as White, Whitehead would say. Um, yeah, to, to carry on. Um, mm, on to, right, okay. That would be fine. Um, I suspect these materialistic ideas have been turned over by humans wherever they had the leisure for such idle speculations. I mean, I think, I think we'd be doing this naturally. Um, and Descartes, I think, just had the misfortune to write them all down, which is why a lot of... Uh, a lot of our discontents currently get laid at his door. Uh, my point here is that the necessary experiencing of materials by us so, e so easily leads us on to the unnecessary materialism as an explanation for the nature of things, a sort of curse of the isms, if you like. Um, if one wants a point of view of the physicalists, uh, Werner Heisenberg and Arthur Eddington state these issues very clearly and point to the problems which arise from Cartesian thought. So it's not only coming from the biologists. A couple of clicks with the mouse and hours turn into days. You know the problem. We've all been there, okay? Um, but here I want to explore the perspectives of biologists, especially those of Russell, Russell's background of growing up through the mechanism vitalism debate is worth noting here. Jack Lobb and Hans Strich went head to head at the end of the 19th and the beginning of 20th century, with Lobb and mechanism supposedly winning and Drich largely retiring from biology and moving into spiritualism. Well, that's the narrative. Of passing note, Alfred Russell Wallace and Arthur Conan Doyle also retreated into spiritualism too, so perhaps there was something in the water. Um, there is an Aberdeen connection with Drish, for it was, it was um, while he was professor of natural theology there that he presented his Gifford lectures in 1906-1908, The Science and the Philosophy of the Organism, published in 1908 and again second edition. 1929. So these are some of the influences on Russell. Are there any other particular mentors on his thinking? Yes. Um, by his own admission, John Graham Kerr, the first Regis Professor of Zoology at Glasgow University, previously the chair was the title of Natural History, and John Arthur Thompson, Professor of Natural History at Aberdeen University, and also Patrick Geddes. Make what you want, make what you can of them, but all three had very expansive views of nature and the natural, natural world. Geddes especially was clearly someone, he was, he was a force of nature, Geddes. I think it's difficult not to say that. Um, and, and that's understating the obvious. Yeah, he was a hurricane in the mill pond, um, everything, everything he drove his mind to, 
he drove forward in, in, in many ways. Uh, the most recent major attempts to address research and transcend and critique or support materialistic thought can be found then in the efforts of several biologists over the first few decades of the 20th century. That is after the vitalism mechanism debate, confrontations of Dreich and Loeb, and especially in the aftermath of World War I, mechanism's first total war. Quite recently, I'd have guessed that the number of major figures here was certainly more than 20, but probably less than 50. Nationalities included persons from Britain, Austro-Hungary, Germany, Italy, Russia, the Baltic States, Scandinavia, USA, Canada, France, perhaps Japan. But it does seem that more and more individuals, having said very interesting things, keep getting uncovered by the historians and philosophers of biology as the parish records of biological sciences are turned over by them. And we begin to view the efforts of these biologists beyond narrow horizons and our prejudices. Russell then was one of these biologists, but again, I stress he was not alone in this enterprise. There was a community of effort here, but a community that did not all move in the same direction. Think perhaps more ferrets in a sack rather than sheep in the hill. Although Russell does come over as a ferret with very gentle manners. While his mind is always pain sharp, there is no malice in his criticism and no poison in his inks. He is searching for understanding to develop and support his points of view, but also explore the alternatives. He states his perspectives without polemics and certainly without histrionics. But he has a steely resolve for his aim for promoting a biology beyond materialism. And, and how did you yourself get interested or get involved in, in these ideas? Well, I, I hadn't experienced Russell until the early 1980s. Um, my first recognition uh, that there existed the potential for a different biology occurred in Trinidad in the early 1980s. I was a staff member at the University of the West Indies. University of the West Indies being, I think, one of only two remaining organizations which still have a cast for the idea of a federation for English speaking nation states of the Caribbean. The other organization is West Indies Cricket. I pulled a copy of Joseph Henry Woodger's Biological Principles, published 1929, off a dusty shelf in a small library of what was then the Commonwealth Institute of Biological Control and had previously been part of Imperial College of Tropical Agriculture. Well, nobody had ever mentioned Woodger to me during my biological education, but here I was holding an attempt to address biological principles in great breadth and depth. In the preface acknowledgments, page nine, page nine, the name of Edward Stuart Russell appears thus, quote, to Dr. E.S. Russell, I am indebted for reading the manuscript from a biological point of view and making a number of helpful criticisms, close quote. This then was my first exposure to the possibility of a post-materialistic, post-Cartesian biology. So this book by Joseph Henry Woodger, published mm -hmm. in 1929, yeah. was a key work. Yes, I think Woodger's still the major work, and it certainly hasn't been uh, superseded by any sense, and it certainly hasn't been analysed. But it is, um, it is getting worked on now by the philosophers and historians of biology in a way it should be. And hopefully it'll tumble back into, into biological thought again. Bio, biological principles was, in Woodrow's own words, an attempt to try and do for biology what Robert Boyle had done for chemistry in 1661 with the sceptical chemist. Biological principles was 498 pages of closely argued text addressing the problems, pitfalls and potentials of biological thought. Woodger was trying to clear the undergrowth over the path to a biological way of thought by taking a skeptical gaze at what biological thought had already uncovered, or rather what biological thought had thought that it uncovered. 
Russell and Woodger then were two biologists that tried to shift biology from the furrows of Cartesian thought into which it had buried itself for centuries. And this then leads to Russell's first book. Yes, Russell's first book was published before he's the age of 30. He's about 29, it comes out, and he's, he's obviously been working on it for several years. Um, Russell's first book, Form and Function, A Contribution to the History of Animal Morphology, was published in 1916. That's the year of the Battle of Jutland and of the Somme. Among the dry yet precise discussions on the history of biological thought from Aristotle to 1900, he slips in the following sentence, page 345, quote, It may well be that the intransigent materialism of the 19th century is merely an episode, an aberration rather in the history of biology, an aberration brought about by the over-rapid development of a materialistic and luxurious civilization in which man's material means have outrun his mental and moral growth, close quote. The problems that Russell saw with materialism are thereby clearly stated. He states the problems. Does he come up with possible solutions or at least approaches to them? Yes. Um, he publishes a book in 1924, and uh, it's titled, it's, a short, it's only a short work, it's called The Study of Living Things, a Prolegomena to a Functional Biology. And uh, I'll give a quote from page 31, which sort of summarizes where he's going, really. And uh, quoting, we conceive then that all living things, insofar as they manifest behavior, are monads psychophysical individuals or subjects, each perceiving in its own objective world and reacting to this perceived world in such a way as to satisfy its own needs and desires. Each organism would have its own individual viewpoint upon the universe. And instead of an abstract, lifeless, quantitative universe of the physical sciences, which is itself merely a facet of reality seen from the generalized human standpoint and remaining within the bounds of the conceptual objective world of the human monad, we should have to think of a qualitative universe containing a multitude of active individualities, each, in, each mirroring in its own way that aspect of reality which is accessible to it and has meaning for it. So he's Close moving forward. away. Oh. Yeah, so he's, sorry, I was just going yeah. to say that yeah. to pick up on that, he's, he's moving away. That, that's a fascinating phrase, the abstract, lifeless, quantitative universe of the physical sciences. He's moving away from something very dry to something in which living things have a much more rich and much more natural form in which light, living things really are the starting point in their own right. Yes, I think, I, think that, I think that's a good summary of it. The living thing for Russell was both an object of study, but it was also a subject in its own right, having an ontogeny, a lifespan of its own. Um, in 1930, Russell published The Interpretation of Development and Heredity, which further expanded his method and especially critiqued particulate theories of inheritance. In my paraphrasing, Russell notes that one can, of course, take a gene-centric view of the organism, but this does not exclude one from taking an organism-centric view of the gene. The gene concept in 1930 is, of course, not the gene concept in 1960, 1990, or 2020, but the relations of the whole to the parts and the parts to the whole have not changed, however, and these two differing perspectives remain. Russell gave lectures on animal behavior at UCL during the 1930s, and The Behavior of Animals, an introduction to its study, was published in 1934 and again in 1938. The final chapter, chapter 10, addressed the issue of perceptual worlds as being functional. Page 179, quote, each animal selects from the possible perceptual environment only those features that are significant in relation to its life and ignores the rest. In this sense, each animal makes its, makes 
its own world of perception, close quotes. Rather than just the environment selecting for the organism, the organism is here selecting from the environment. Choice and not chance is thus a necessity. That is quite remarkable because we're used to thinking of all living things as subject to the vicissitudes of blind chance, of changes in the environment that inevitably shape them one way or the other. And this is a much more powerful picture of living things actually selecting. And so the relationship between the organism and the environment is a kind of dynamic, almost like a two-way relationship. Yes, and in fact, I'm not, I don't think it can be separated. It is a, it, there is a unity there. The organism without the environment doesn't exist. You know, we have to have an environment. You know, that's, just, that's just how it is. It's not, you know, it's not organism or environment. It's organism and environment. You know, that, that, is, that, is, uh, that is Russell's, where Russell's uh, thought is going. Animal behaviour for Russell then amounted to the total doing and becoming of the organism. For him, maintenance, growth, development, reproduction, learning, perception, all belong within the realm of the behaviour of the living thing. Certainly the living animal. He, he, was, a, he was a zoologist, not a, not a botanist, so he doesn't venture into into plants, but of course now uh, others have ventured into plants and just seen how responsive they are to functioning. Um, in March 1939, Russell gave a series of lectures at John Hopkins, Johns Hopkins University on the overfishing problem arising from his efforts over 25 years in trying to understand the dynamics the physical, the biological, the social, the political of the fishing industry and the attempts to create local, national and international cooperation for stock exploitation and conservation. He was intimately involved in the development of ICES, the International Council for the Exploration of the Seas. And uh, international cooperation was thus possible. Britain declared war on Germany on the 1st of September 1939. The lectures were published in 1942 as the overfishing problem. So, so here he is as a, a practical naturalist. That is practical side, yeah. And, and getting to grips with what the basic dynamics at many different levels are of the fishing industry. He's not just looking at it from one particular viewpoint. Um, Russell then was the naturalist. He's wringing insight out of a broad front of information rather than the experimentalist trying to change one variable at a time while keeping everything else the same. I still find myself asking, what does this mean, keeping everything else the same, especially when you're dealing with living organisms? So, you know, there's a, there's a, a, a huge conceptual problem there that I, I've got to say, I confess to, to not, not being clear on. Russell's day job amounted to trying to make sense of fishery statistics with, in his view, the aim to give two classes of men sufficient wriggle room to lead satisfactory lives. The classes of men being the fishermen and the naturalists. And there was still at least one more book to come after this? There's still one more book to come. The last book Russell wrote um, was published in 1945, The Directiveness of Organic Activities. Again, Russell is stressing the need to look at the living thing as a living thing, an outlet, an outlet which can be found in Patrick Geddes' view, for example, of the nature of life, and also in Spinoza. And it is a translation quotation of Spinoza's that Russell cites here in the final chapter entitled, final chapters titled The Concept of Organism, page 919, quote, the effort by which each thing endeavours to persist in its own being is nothing else than the existence of the thing itself, that is Spinoza, close quotes. The living thing has to be accepted as a living thing. Russell here is returning to Aristotle. 
and two causes which have almost been lost from Western thought since the post-Renaissance, the formal cause, the essence of the thing in itself, and the final cause, the telos, essence and purpose have thus been removed from a worldview which we have con collectively chosen to shrink to chance and necessity, if you like. And looking across our culture now, it looks like the efficient cause, the necessity for continuity and conservation of function is heading for the junk folder or the spam can too. So what's left of Aristotle's four causes? Just the material? So sapiens? <laughs> Do we have any sense of irony? Dramatic irony? Or is it only the tragic variety we have now? So that's his final book in 1945. There was one further publication. There's another, for this, there's a, another major publication that comes out. And this is his last publication. And it's entitled The Diversity of Animals, an Evolutionary Study. It was published in 1962, eight years after Russell's death. The diversity is just a draft manuscript but the preface of the editors explains its publication, and I quote, Shortly before his death, Dr. Russell sent the typescript of this book to Holland in the hope that it would be possible to get the manuscript published. However, although accompanied by excellent recommendations, the manuscript remained unpublished. The editors regretted the situation for, according to their opinion, the manuscript contained many elements of great importance for biology in general and theoretical biology in particular. Therefore, the editors decided to publish this book in their Bibliotheca, Bibliotheoretica series, notwithstanding that the manuscript contained an overwhelming amount of factual knowledge, close quotes. This is Russell's unfinished synthesis of organism and evolution. Organism and evolution beyond material cause, finding room for the formal, the efficient, and the final causes too. Curiously, or perhaps not, Michael Graham's obituary of Russell, published in the IC's journal, The Council, closes with an observation of there being four strands to Russell's character. I quote, alert for the new, ever sifting the truth from the old, mindful that human understanding is limited, fond of his fellow men. It was not a bad prescription for a life to leave a mark, close quote. That is, that is fascinating and, uh, and a, a wonderful obituary. Now, a number of questions have been coming in while we've been speaking and Eric's been listening to what you've been saying and making some notes and he has some questions of his own as well. So Eric, it's, it's over to you. Thank you very much. What a fascinating uh, discussion you guys have just had. Um, and it really does uh, stimulate the, the thought. It brought back to me, Robin, when I was a, back, a school student doing higher biology back in 1974, I remember how whole or how holistic I, that subject was at that time. You know, it wasn't elemental as such. And that actually continued on to my first year at university. I did biochemistry as my first degree. And the very first year, and as you will remember, in Scottish universities, it's quite a general year. And the biology and things were all very whole and real and you could... You know, you learned about the organisms and the, the individual functions, you know, how the organism survived. And then once you went into your second, third and fourth years, it all became fragmented and elemental. Apart from, I would say, microbiology, which I think remained pretty functional. And that was important to me because I ended up doing distilling and yeast functions and how it actually worked was very, very important. So, you know, that... um that separation of holistic or wholeness versus going right down into almost you know, molecular biology, you know, they're, they're essential. They're essential to understand things. But you've got to, and I think you've got to keep coming back to the whole. And that's what um, Edward Russell's views sound to me like if I have been picking things up uh, correctly, Robin. 
Yes, I think that's right. I mean, there are there are a number of biologists, as I say, there are a number of biologists like Russell, and they are of many different nationalities, and they see something in a different way than just redu uh, a reductionist approach, uh, and and. And I think that's, to me, that's the nature of the biologist. And it can be, you know, it can be in microbiology that they, they grasp this as well. And, you know, microbiology has really only come through as strongly as it has in the last 60, 70 decades, maybe uh, six, seven decades. Um, but it's this, um, it's a perception. And, it, and it's something that, that is a quote of Whitehead somewhere where um, Whitehead, says you know, that the real problem is with the half truth believing it's the whole truth you know that's that's where our problems lie you know we we expand the half truth to make a whole truth but we're only seeing half the picture mm -hmm. you know uh, that and I, I think that's that's what we've got to that's what we've always got to fight against i think and there's a huge difficulty in creating good synthesis I think, um, uh, because you, it can be very easily a glib synthesis, but a, a proper synthesis is a is a hugely difficult thing to to create. But I, you know, I think Russell is well in the way to creating a, a, a synthesis mm -hmm. because he's not against he's not against the material, but he doesn't want it to be just the material. He's not against the mechanical, but he doesn't he wants it not to be just the mechanical. Yeah. You know, he's trying to take it on. Yeah. He doesn't I, I, want it to be just the biological. He wants it to be the psychological as well. Yeah. So yeah, I was you know, there's, up on there's that. this of yeah. continuity. Yeah, I was picking up on that. I'll, I'll come back to that actually in a, in, mm -hmm. in a little while with my notes. It's what you said quite early on, you know, humans are, are makers or, you know, doers of things. And obviously we naturally refer to humans as the model for this, but there are obviously other organisms, other mm -hmm. animals. A lot of animals are also makers and doers. You know, they make shelter, they uh, make a pack, they make hunts. You know, they 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 do things together. You know, they they have they have function, they have structures, physical structures. You know, sharp teeth, fast legs. You know, and uh, you know they they use them to um, you know work at basically you know surviving and getting the best, longest life for themselves out of that, if I, again, if I'm picking all this up uh, correctly. So it's very easy to fall, again, into the thinking of the single organism, you know, the human. It's very easy to do that. Mm. But from what I gathered with what you were saying, that you actually, because he talks, you, you were talking about organisms and living things, you know, he's trying to get us to expand mm. out again, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the use of the living living things is interesting. I find because organism also is a, it can easily be ab ab abstracted because um, you know Whiteheadian thought all um, you know verges in the uh, uh, pan panpsychism really where uh, you know Whitehead's almost taking it to the molecules in organism, um, but the molecules not quite. The level of the organism that you know the cat and the mat is, if, you know, there's a there's a huge huge world of difference between these. So, um, and I think, I th yeah, I think Russell's use of um, living things, I think, was a very uh, was a very wise use of words. Um, and he does he, he does mention organism as well, but he tends he tends usually to prefer living living things as right. what what he's trying to deal with and of course you know with the fishing industry he was dealing with living things yeah. you know it was you know the fish eat you know, the fish eat the plankton the humans catch the fish you know there's a huge web of interactions there um that he's that he's tuning into yeah um as i say he's not the experimentalist is a is a reader of statistics uh, professionally. That's really what he's doing, and um, and trying to grasp what's happening in the dynamics of the system that he's trying to get a get a handle on. And um, so there's a, there's a huge broad base that he's that he's taking uh, that is that, that is 
it's a sort of purview, you know. It's a, a remarkable, a remarkable, a remarkable vision I find uh, he has, and as I say, very, very um, steely determination, and uh, but also very humble too. Uh, so he comes over as a very interesting character. Mm -hmm. There was, so there was a, um, there was a debate. There was a lecture one time. At, festival the live festival a couple of years ago now heavy and it was about you know the definition of what is a living thing you know a virus mm -hmm. for instance you know and uh, or, or you know something a bit more um complex than that you said something no robin there was, there was something for me that you said uh was there was a desire right there is a desire or a drive to live or survive a fulfilling life. You mentioned that. Is that a definition mm -hmm. of someone alive? Or is it, you know, the drive to ensure, is it further than that? Is it the desire, the follow-up desire to ensure that your species or your type of organism actually survives, you know, post you? Um, there's, there's something there about the desire or the drive. Yes, it? I think it's the drive, the drive of the organism, the drive, the drive of the living thing. Yeah, and I think Spinoza, I'm not sure the date of that that Spinoza quote, but Spinoza's grasping it, you know, 300 years ago, and uh, you know because it's it, it's essentially the essence of the thing. And as I say, you know, post post Renaissance, we sort of we narrow down. We, you know, it's an interesting it's an interesting. Uh, you know, the Renaissance is is a great flowering, but then as soon as it's flowered. We're pulling, we're pulling the petals off it. You, uh, you know, it's uh, is that just the human way, or is it just our human way, or is it just you know, uh, we narrow, we narrow down. So if we narrow down, we've got to be aware that we are narrowing down, and therefore we've got to be able to flip back and widen up again. You know, as I say, that's that. The half truth can't become the whole truth. The half truth must be recognised for what it is. And then we go forward from that. I think that's my, yeah, you know, that's sort of where where Russell's Russell's trying to get to. And as I say, he's not alone. I mean, Woodger is a magnificent, magnificent figure. I mean, Woodger is a colossus. And uh, and yeah, you know, I went through a whole biological career, and, and you know, I found him, yeah, you know, at the fag end of empire and a, a dusty shelf, you know, forgotten about, which which he has been forgotten about. Yeah, you know, and he gets written off in the 1980s with Russell as well as being failures, you know. And you say, well, it was a failure, you know. You know, you don't appreciate it, but you know, you know, I, I, you know that this is, you know, and then as I say, it's only now that it's the, yeah, you know, and it's it's thanks to the philosophers and the historians that they're doing it, you know, largely not the biologists that are picking up on it. You know, because they've moved on in another direction and it's the historians and the philosophers that are saying, wait a minute, this guy is important or these guys are important or these are important concepts. You know? we, can't just, we can't just, you know, uh, hide them under the carpet. You know, they're, they're staring you in the face. Are you prepared to, are you prepared to stare, them, you know, stare back at them? Yeah, I think so, you know, Russell has a steeliness. He has a steely steeliness. Yeah. He comes up against um, another major figure, Joseph Needham, at the same time. Needham's a chemical embryologist and a, an outstanding, outstanding mind, Needham. I have no doubt about that whatsoever. And he goes on, of course, he become, does um, Chinese civilization, Chinese science and civilization and, um, and lives, lives uh, almost to be 100, I think, Needham. And... Uh, you know, gets involved in all sorts of things with China and uh, the development of Chinese civilization after he's done a huge amount in chemi chemical embryology. But he and, uh, he and Russell did not see eye to eye in any sense. And I think um, Needham wanted to persuade people to his view, and I don't think Russell was persuadable. Mm. No. It does come over as there is a huge... Uh polarization of yeah. views in this subject because I was going well, there are huge polarization and everyone's got, and and as they should have because everyone's you know, because Russell was saying we've all got our own view of the universe we've got to make sense of it yeah, yeah. 
because it's almost like a chicken and egg puzzle here. You know, there's the did we develop the physical and mental attributes and our structures, you know, to to adapt to some environmental pressure. You know, that's probably Darwinian and things like that. Or did we already have these physical and mental attributes and we've just learned to apply them, you know, when the environmental pressure has said you need to apply them, you know? Um, yes, I think it's the, I think you've got to take, you've got to have a concept of the depth of the organism, really. I think you've got to think of the deep time of the organism and um, your know, deep time is another, you know, that's another um, product of Scottish thought, if you like, with Hutton. You know, it's Hutton that generates deep time just by looking and realising a nonconformity is something very different. And he could, you know, he, he had that ability to step because many people must have seen unconformities. But you know, something about Hutton is he could put the thing together and realize what you're looking at. And then suddenly out of that, you've created deep time. Yeah, you know, and it's deep time that lets Darwin fall into something. You know, Darwin, the geologist, is is um is almost primary to. Darwin, Darwin, the biologist, you know, he's, got, he's got the concept of deep time that lets it go. But, you know, if you go into your biochemistry, you know, how, you know, how ancient is the Krebs cycle or something like that? You know, how, how old are these things, you know, that we're looking, you know, we're looking, we're looking at, you know, they're, they're fundamental to, uh, you know, to living, to all living creatures, you know, so... How you know, what are we what are we, what are we de dealing with here? You're, we're dealing with an immensity, and it's this immensity I think that is the danger of getting lost if you just narrow down. That's why you've got to flip it back and go the other way and open it up again. You know, we can all be we can all be flies in the fly bottle, but you know sometimes you've got to you know let the stopper and the flies have got to go out. Yeah. You know? yeah. I was, I was taken by your, um, again, the, the way you described it, it's the, the perceptual functional argument that you described as choice versus chance. Mm. And uh, that got me thinking about um, choice versus chance. Is this all an either or argument? Or is it a combination, is it a mixture of the two? Is one more dominant than the other when certain environmental pressures come yeah. on? I think it's. I think it's both. I think it's yeah. both. You know, and um, but you've got to be aware of chance because, you know, uh, you know, spatial, a uh, spatial temporal, um, a spatial temporal uh, happening isn't the same as chance. You know, there, there is a there is a spatial temporality there that perhaps we haven't been able to tune into, you know, the way um, one, of, one of the philosophers wrote a book, uh, wrote a paper about what, what, what it's like to be a bat. But I mean, you can do that with anything. Um, but the one, the interesting one that's come up recently is um, adip adipose fins on things like salmonids, you know, they were called adipose fins. They were fatty fins, but then, you know, People started looking at them and realizing that they're hugely innervated. They've got a huge innervation. You know, there's a huge plexus of nerves associated with them, and they're um, they're hydrodynamic. They're hydrodynamic um, feedback system that's picking up all sorts of things from the water. You know, we've got no concept of that really. You know, we we don't have a we we don't have a sensory system that uh, of 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 one of of what the salmonids have, but I mean, you know, you you look at what then has come out of just you know something which was previously an adipose fin, and then you look at it again and you think, goodness me, this this is an awful lot more. There's a no, there's a whole and you know that whole that whole world of the salmon, you know, the salmonids, and you know you've got huge migrations involved in many of them, yeah. and. Uh, and they've got you know, their conceptual world isn't the same as our conceptual world. No. Yeah, it's. I'll tell you, here's something slightly. It's not off the wall. It's just slightly new. On the news today, right? There was a, an, an article about 
artificial intelligence. And I'm just wondering where this way of thinking, this philosophy fits into it. You know, or is artificial intelligence, have we just forgotten it? It's actually, it's just an extension of us humans making and doing things. You know, we're, we're making artificial intelligence sound like it's a completely separate entity that's evolved in its own right, but it's not. It's part of our... It's, it's, it's us, really, isn't it? Just a fancy hammer, is it? Fancy hammer, yeah, 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 yeah. That's no, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know enough about you know, where they've got to with it or how, how they can do it. But again, I think you can get away from the organism and the environment is one. You know, that's that's the unity. You know, somehow that that is the unity. You know, the, uh, you can argue for the existence of the the physical world beyond the the living thing, but the living thing has got to have the physical world. You know, it, ha it has to be it has to be located somewhere within within the universe, if you like. Yeah. yeah. And again, it's probably this uh, definition of uh, artificial intelligence at the moment. I mean, it doesn't have its own drive or desire to do something. It, it's, it is a tool. It's a fancy hammer. I like that. Yeah, I'm going to keep that yeah. in my head. Or, or, or a full a full metal jacket, maybe. <laughs> to borrow another title. Yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah. I've got a question's coming, which is uh, somebody's a very interesting man and a interesting subject. Are there any books you can recommend or other resources? For us to find out a bit more. Um, yes, yes. I mean, recently uh, there's there's a, a couple of books that have come out that are very excellent. Um, there's uh, Romantic Biology, uh, 1890 to 1945, Maurizio Esposito. I don't know whether you can see it. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't mention Romanticism in this because it does it. There is, an, there is an element of romanticism in the thing, except that romanticism itself is a huge, huge field. And I'm not sure how to ground it uh, in, a, in a short talk, because if you go into romanticism, you're, you know, you've got several hundred years of, of Western thought that, that's going along that path. Isaiah Berlin, I think, is your best, your best guide there um, to try and make something of it. But romantic biology is, is excellent and, and it's very readable about, about these ones. And there's another one on, by Eric Peterson, The Life Organic. You can see that one. Yes, you can see that. And this covers what was the theoretical biology club and this is what Woodger founded that. Well, Woodger and Needham were the, the prime movers on it. Russell isn't a member, which in itself is quite interesting. It may just be that uh, you know, his terms of contract didn't allow him to um, associate with uh, uh, a lot of communists and, and uh, hardline socialists in the 1930s. I don't know. Um, but... Uh, Peterson, that's a, that's a very good, very good uh, introduction and uh, very comprehensive uh, look at it at this whole field because, as I say, it is a whole field and it is it's widening as you know every every uh, every month there's another very interesting paper coming out and the things widening. As I say, it's the historians and it's the philosophers that are are digging at it. And, and, you know, they're the ones that are going to flip the biologists on it, I think, because at some point the biologists will say, we've got to look at this again, I think. I mean, I think that's, that would be my reading of it. You know, it's, it'll, it's got to flip again. Well, Robin, I'm going to hand you back to Howie, but thank you very much for indulging uh, me and my, <laughs> my questions and my thoughts. Uh, fascinating. <laughs> Okay, how are you? Back to you, my friend. Oh, thank you, Eric. You, th these are very interesting questions, and I've been following the discussion. And they were just to, to sum up with them a few uh, a few points. One seems to be that there is this undercurrent which was very much below the surface for a long time, but seems to be starting to to come to the surface again, in which 
living things, which of course includes us and, and, and all our environment, living things are being valued more. And possibly this could come at a particularly appropriate time because as humans, we've been rather disregarding the living world about us and destroying it in considerable quantities, whether it's rainforests for timbers or whether timber or whether it's living habitat of many species that are becoming extinct because we have a, a use for their land. So it could be indeed just reflecting on this that Russell is very much a, a man for our time and particularly interesting, um, Robin, what you were saying that the the philosophers and the historians are in many senses leading the way. Yes, I think I think that's true. I mean, it's not it's not to say that there aren't biologists involved as well, but I, I think it's a it's almost a broader movement than that, because I think it is you you are tackling issues like materialism and and the nature of materialism and the limits of materialism. And I think you're also, I think uh, um, you're also tackling things like romanticism and an alternative, if you like, to um, to materialism that that can function for you know can function for the many, not the few. I think that would be you know that would be what what one would be trying to aim at. You know, we are. We are hugely creative. There's no doubt about that. But we are also hugely, hugely destructive. You know, there's no doubt about that either. So you know, we've got to, you know, we've got to grasp the, you know, we've. I think we've got to grasp our essence, if you like, and we've got to grasp our telos. I think, you know, in, in an, an Aristotelian sense, and you know, control your control your materialism, and I think that's. Somewhere there, hopefully, we can, uh, you know, we can uh, stagger on. Robin, thank you very much indeed for a fascinating insight on a remarkable man. Warm thanks to, to Eric for joining us. And Eric will be back with us hopefully next week. And when our guest will be Andrew Painting of the Mar Estate, speaking about the regeneration of a landscape. Our thanks to, to Swain and John behind the scenes, keeping everything flowing forward. And our thanks to you, the viewers and listeners for joining us this evening. And with that, it's time to say goodbye now.